Good evening, everyone. Uh, you're all very welcome. Just before we start our meeting, we're just going to stay in our seats and sing a few choruses. So the first one is number 14 in the chorus book, number 14. Ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. His work is perfect and all his ways are just. spent and worthless now compared to this. Mm -hmm. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me.
singing. Let me welcome each of you to our gospel service this evening. Whether you've joined us here in the building or online, thank you very much for joining us. Also good to have Ken McFarland with us this evening as our uh, speaker. And Ken, we thank you um, for what you've prepared for this evening. And also good to welcome back John Fulton as our, full, as our soloist. So thank you very much for joining us also. So let's start our service together by standing to sing number 137 in the Red Book. There is a fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Stand the same. to open our meeting to. Uh, let's just come to prayer now and as we do, let's remember our time uh, together this evening, but also remember those who have gone out to speak in other places. Peter Ritchie, who's up in Port Ross Baptist today, and also Hugh Martin, who's in Limavady Baptist. And of course, our upcoming Easter convention, let's continue to remember those meetings in prayer. So let's pray. 
Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this, your day, for this Palm Sunday that um, enters us into the Easter period, the time of year where we specifically remember the reason why you sent your Son from heaven to earth, to die as our Savior, to die to take away the punishment, to pay the price for our sins. Father, we thank you for this time that we share together this evening. We pray, Lord, that it would be a great time of fellowship and of praise sung to you. We thank you for your holy word, the Bible, for all that it has to teach us. And we pray, Lord, that you'd be with Ken this evening, that you'd use him tonight and speak through him, and that he would be a blessing to all of us. But particularly, Father, for this gospel service, we just pray for those who don't yet know you as their saviour. And that even just tonight, they would um, feel your presence on their lives and feel their need to be forgiven of their sins. Father, we also just pray... For Joanne this evening, we thank you for bringing her among us this evening and ask that you would be with her as she ministers to us in song. And Father, for those across the country tonight who are opening up your word to share it with others, we just pray that you would be with them, particularly with Peter and with Hugh as they speak in Port Rush and up in Limavati also. Father, we just thank you for our upcoming Easter convention. We just pray you would be with Paul and with all those who are currently preparing to minister Um, your word at those meetings, either by opening the scripture and teaching us from it, or by ministering in song. So Father, we thank you for the love that you have for each and every one of us. The love that sent your son to die at the cross, but he conquered death, rose again, and one day he's coming back. So Lord, be with us this evening. Bless this time together, we ask, in our Savior's risen name. Amen. Amen. So once again, Joanne, thank you very much for joining us. You're very welcome. And just invite you now to come to your first two pieces.
Thank you very much, Joanne. We're looking forward to hearing from you again just uh, in a few minutes. Just to run through the announcements then for uh, the next couple of weeks. Uh, as you know, there's no Bible study on tomorrow night as we're now into the Easter period. So we have our upcoming Easter convention, our annual convention, with uh, Paul Ferguson will be speaking at each of those meetings. And then Alex Robb and Stephen Anderson will be the singers. And there's plenty of invitation cards out in the foyer. You can grab a few and share them out. So we're meeting on Thursday at half past seven. So it's earlier than the normal um, permitting time of eight o'clock. So half past seven on Thursday, half past seven on Friday, and then the normal times for Sunday when we meet at, at uh, half ten in the morning for the bringing of bread, followed by the family service at half eleven, and then the gospel meeting at 7 p.m. And as I said, that's part of our Easter convention, so please do grab some of those invitations and share them around. As for this incoming week, uh, the door-to-door -door is on on Tuesday at quarter past 10 in the morning and 7.45 in the evening. So please do pray for those who go around the local area for that outreach. Then half past six on Wednesday is the children's meeting. Then we start into our Easter convention and there is no uh, youth fellowship this incoming Saturday. You can have a break from that and then that takes us on to the following week. And on Easter Tuesday, we have our annual tradition of going to Tullymore Forest for the duck race. 
So make sure you get that in your diary. And if you have a rubber duck, you can practice in your bathtub. Just make sure your duck wins that race. And of course, there always are some prizes. So please do come along for that. And we'll have um, lunch and things while we're there. And there'll be more details for that to come. If you have a CEF box, then please note that they are now due. So return those in to Norma Murray. Now, over the past few Monday nights, Andrew Daly was taking us through a series in the book of Haggai, and if you missed any of that, you can catch up online. But this week, Andrew uh, is in Lisburn Congregational, and he's speaking at each night this week for a series of Easter meetings. So you're allowed to go to see Andrew Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, Friday. You have to be here. That's the sort of rule, okay? But you can go and support Andrew at those meetings in Lisburn. Also note then, the following weekend, the, for the young people, we have our weekend away. We're heading to Portadown, we're staying in the Faith Mission Center, and Danny Roberts from LMI will be the speaker at that weekend, and we've got a lot of fun activities planned as well. So uh, the deadline really is as soon as possible, but if you haven't booked and you're interested in coming, or you know someone who's of secondary school age who would like to come, there's application forms out in the foray, or you can fill it in online, or come and talk to me and Ben, and you'd be very welcome to join us for that weekend away. And if you're too old, you can still remember us in prayer and for all the activities and things that are happening that weekend as we open up the word of God with uh, the young people. So I think those are all, no, they're not all the announcements. So cleaning teams, there's a sheet out in the foyer. So if you are available and would like to join up to support cleaning the church uh, and keeping it good for all of us to join in the meetings, there's a, there's a sign-up sheet there. And then also the delivery of Bibles from the Amazing Journey that was in the schools in the local area. Um, if you are free to go around and deliver those Bibles that the, the children have asked for, please do put your name on those sheets. And of course, pray for those Bibles as they go out and they'll be used as well. So now I think that's all the announcements. So we're going to sing again. Uh, this one is in the screen. It's not in any of the books. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. And then once we've sung this, we'll hand back over to Joanne for her final piece and then over to Ken for the rest of the meeting. <laughs>
Thank you. Great words, and you sung them well. So once again, Joanne, you and your family, you're very welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'll just hand over to you now.
Could I ask you to turn, please, to Acts chapter 3? I'd like to thank Robert for his welcome. And I'd like to thank our sister for those pieces and song. We know that the Lord will bless them to each of our hearts this evening. Acts chapter 3, commencing to read at verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together unto the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him, with John said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping stood up and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look you so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murder to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot that that through ignorance ye did it, as did your rulers. But those things which God before hath showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled." Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Pray that the Lord will bless the public reading of his word. Give me a word of prayer, please. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for being able to come into your most holy presence. We thank you again for the public reading of your word. And Lord, we acknowledge that every time we open its pages, every time we read it or it's read publicly, you have something to say. And Heavenly Father, we trust that there's some soul here tonight that you have a message for. We pray that the Holy Spirit will work and move from heart to heart, from seat to seat, bringing conviction upon those who are still outside of Christ. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the Lord Jesus Christ, who came and died and shed his blood at the place called Calvary. We've already been reminded in the messages and song of what he has done and accomplished for us at Calvary. And so, Lord, we pray tonight that the Holy Spirit will take everything, the hymns, the singing of the pieces, and the message that he will bring it home to some heart, that someone may be given the grace and the courage to put their trust in the Lord tonight. We remember Peter again in Port Rush and uh, Hugh up in Limavati. We pray you will encourage them and bless them and use them tonight to the salvation of some soul. So Lord, shut us in with yourself. Encourage our hearts and bless us tonight. In the Saviour's name we ask it. Amen. 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 Some of you, if not all, will have heard about the uproar on Wednesday in King's Cross Station in London. The gentleman in charge decided to show a bit of inclusivity The month of Ramadan started and he thought it would be a good idea to put a quotation from 
the Islamic scriptures on the screen. And apparently he'd been doing it for eight or nine days and everything went all right. But on Wednesday, there was an uproar. Humanists UK were on the phone, on the computer. People walking into the station, walking out of the station, went up and made complaints. So much so that they had to remove the message from the board. The people weren't complaining because he had put the message up, because he'd been doing it now for about eight days. They weren't complaining about the source of the message. They were complaining about the contents of the message. And the contents of the message, if I remember rightly, was this. All the sons of Adam are sinners, but the best sinners are those that repent often. And the objection was that people were being called sinners and were being told that they needed to repent. That's what Peter is telling the crowd that is gathered round him here in the temple. He says, repent ye therefore and be converted that the sins may be blotted out. What does repentance mean? Well, the dictionary tells us that repentance means to feel regret for the wrongdoings or sin. But Warren Wearsby says that's okay as far as it goes. Warren used to be connected with Youth for Christ and one time many years ago he was in a church and he asked the young people in front of him, give me an explanation for repentance. Give me, what does it mean? And he says, one young girl stood up and he says he's never forgotten it. And she simply said, repentance is to be sorry, sorry for your sin enough to quit. To be sorry for your sin enough to quit. To quit. And that's been God's message down through the millennia from Himself to mankind. Because each one of us who come into this world come into this world a sinner. And because sin was inside us when we were born, as we grew up and matured, we committed sins. There are three things I want to bring to your attention this evening as time permits. The first thing I want to say about this text is, first of all, it's an action to be performed. An action to be performed. You see, if someone wants to repent, they're going to have to make a conscious and deliberate decision to do that. You can't go to bed and wake up the next morning and discover you've repented in your sleep. Or you can't drift into repentance. It's a conscious and deliberate decision, it's a decision we all must make. We must make it, first of all, because of sin, as I've said. David in Psalm 51 says this, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. What's David saying? Well, C.H. Spurgeon says David is making a statement. He's saying that there's a natural tendency inside every one of us, and we bring that with us when we came into the world. In other words, we are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. We're sinners at the very moment that we're born. In Romans chapter 3, the Apostle Paul writing says this, What then? Are we better than they? No in no wise, for we have proved both Jew and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And friends, that includes you and me this evening. Every single one of us. If we are honest with ourselves and we look back on our lives, we didn't choose to go and seek God. We didn't choose to go to God and ask for forgiveness. It was God who came and sought us. It's a necessary action because of sin. But can I suggest it's a necessary action again because of God? In Acts chapter 17, Paul is in, in Athens waiting for his friends to catch up on him. And he's looking around Mars Hill and they've got shrines and altars to every known Roman or Greek god. 
But there's one shrine Paul notices and it says to the unknown God. And Paul says, I want to tell you about this one, this unknown God. And he tells him about Jehovah, about how he created the world, how he gave life to everything, how he sustains life and everything. And then he comments about their idolatry. And then he comes down to verse 30 in Acts 17 and he says this, the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Notice the word in that. God now commandeth. You see, God knows what you and I need. God knows we're on our way to a lost eternity. God knows that if we die without Christ, we're going to end up in the lake of fire. And God doesn't want us to be lost. God wants us to be saved. An action to be performed, it's a necessary action because of the sin in our lives. It's a necessary action because God requires it. When the Lord Jesus Christ was on earth, you remember on one occasion he says, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. John the Baptist, when he came along four years earlier, said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Some of these people Peter was talking to may have gone out to see John the Baptist in the wilderness. They may have stood and listened to Christ preach. So the message wasn't a new one. It's a necessary action you have to take, repent. But can I suggest also it's a personal action? You see, I can't repent for you because I don't know what sins you've committed, so I can't repent for them. But then again, you can't repent for me because you don't, my, don't know my sins. In Ezekiel chapter 18, God through the prophet says this, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. In other words, every one of us will answer for our own deeds. Therefore, every one of us must repent as a group of individuals. Paul was speaking to maybe 20, 30, maybe more people. But he wasn't speaking to them as a group, one solid group. He was speaking to them as a group of individuals. It was as if Peter looked at them and went, repent, 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 and pointed at every one of them. And tonight, God sends that message to you and to me again tonight. It's a necessary action because of our sin. It's a personal action. Each one of us must make the decision for ourselves. F.B. Mayer says, God deals with the nation by dealing with individuals. God saves families one person at a time. He saves Christians one individual at a time. But it's not only a necessary action and a personal action. Can I tell you this? It's an urgent action. It's urgent, first of all, because of God's patience. In the Red Hymn Book, hymn number 230, the last verse says this, O sinner, God's patience may weary some day and leave thy sad soul in the blast by willful resistance, and notice that phrase, willful resistance, you've drifted away over the deadline at last. In Genesis chapter 6, God comes to Noah, and he says, my spirit shall not always strive with man, and yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. God guaranteed the world in Noah's day a hundred and twenty years before judgment would fall. Come forward to Jonah. Jonah walks into the city of Nineveh. What did he say? A hundred and twenty years? No. Forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. What about today? Friend, God doesn't guarantee us 40 seconds, let alone 40 days. The scripture says, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. None of us knows what a day may bring forth. God says, I, we're not guaranteed another minute. Someone once said, the breath in your lungs is yours. Your next one is in the hands of God. And he could stop it. We heard just the other week, last week, our brother Colin Hart of the Christian Institute suddenly died. 
God took him home. When Colin got up that morning, he never knew that would be his last day on earth. We need to repent. It's urgent because of God's patience. It may run out. We also need to repent because of death's presence. Hebrews 9 and 27 says, It is appointed unto man once to die, and after death the judgment. In Psalm, 2 Samuel chapter 14, the writer says, For we must needs die, and are as water spilt on the ground which cannot be gathered up again. I worked in one of my incarnations with a, uh, a Jehovah's Witness, and he, you couldn't talk to him, he insisted that those who showed an interest in the things of God, even after they died, God later on is going to bring you back and give you a second chance. Friend, there's no second chance. The life you have, the opportunity you have, it ends when you stop breathing. It's appointed on demand once to die. David, in 2 Samuel, says this as he, the crowd gathered round his bed. I go the way of all the earth. What's David saying? He's saying everybody before me died. Everybody after me is going to die. And if the Lord tarries every one of us here, we'll die. It's the way of all the earth. It's an urgent decision we must make because of God's patience. God may stop prompting you because of death's presence but thirdly because of the church's prospect what's the church's prospect you say for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord the Lord himself turned to, in Matthew 24 and verse 44 says this, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Proverbs 27, the writer says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Yesterday afternoon we were in our shopping centre, and there's a man there who was saved at the age of 60. He's an artist, but he's taken seriously ill. But he paints watercolors and acrylics, and he sells them to provide money for a Christian mission, working amongst boys and girls. It's not the CEF. But hanging on the wee cart, there was a card in lovely writing. And I went over to have a look at it, and it said this. It was the only one hanging there. Jesus is coming. Are you ready? Let me ask you tonight. Jesus is coming. I don't know when. You don't know when. The Lord himself says only the Father knows the day or the hour. Are you ready tonight? If the Lord was to come tonight, a great swathe of the people in this building will just suddenly disappear. Would you go with us or would you be left sitting in the seat where you are? An action that must be performed. But notice secondly, we see a change that must be observed. He says, repent ye therefore and be converted. I was saying to Bertie just before the meeting, when I was 15, we started to go to Craigie Hall or Craigie Baptist, as it now is, and they had their own BB company, 117th Belfast. We had four officers and one staff sergeant. You're looking at the staff sergeant. And every day, every week, every Friday night, after the children's meeting, you had an inspection, and then you had drill. And you marched up and down the hall or round and round the hall. But as you marched down the hall, you were coming to a door, and it could end up with all of us going through a door into the back hall. But the command would come, company left wheel, or company right wheel, or company about turn. We changed direction. That is conversion. The word used for translated converted here 
Is it used, translated in the scriptures as turn, turn about, turn around, turn again. It means to change direction. Peter says, repent and be converted. Change direction. 1958, I went into a wee back room. I was on the broad road leading to a lost eternity with my Sunday school teacher. I come out of that room 20 minutes or so later. I had changed direction. I was in the narrow way heading to heaven and home. Why? Because in that room, in those 20 minutes, I asked the Lord Jesus Christ to come into my heart and the Lord changed my direction. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul is writing to the church and he says, everybody's talking about the change in your life. He says, for they themselves show us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Like the people in Mars Hill that Paul came across, these people served idols. But the moment they put their trust in Christ, the desire for the old things was taken away. The old interests, the old ambitions, it was changed. And he says, you turned away from your idols and you turned to God. There's a passage in 2 Corinthians. And I find it an amazing passage. Paul is writing to Christians, members of an assembly, such as Christians here. And he says this, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says something amazing. He says, and such were some of you. These are church members. And Paul lists a terrible lot of gross sins. And he says, you in the church committed some of these sins. But he doesn't finish there. He says this, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. What's he saying? He's saying, yes, you were involved in all these sins and there were terrible sins, but the moment you put your trust in Christ, your outlook was changed. You no longer wanted to continue in those things. The hymn writer wrote the hymn that says this, the blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary, the blood that gives me strength from day to day shall never lose its power. For it reaches to the highest mountain. It flows through the lowest valleys. The blood that gives me strength from day to day shall never lose its power. The blood of Christ cleansed each of those men in that church in Corinth. Involved in the grossest sins. The blood of Christ was enough to not only cleanse them, but it's enough to cleanse each one in the meeting tonight. Indeed, as I said one morning around the Lord's table, the blood of Christ is sufficient to cleanse every sin that ever has been committed or ever will be committed on this earth by every person who ever has lived or ever will live. The blood of Christ is sufficient to cleanse every sin. Christ came and went to the cross. He loved you and he loved me so much he was the center of worship and of adoration in heaven, and yet he left heaven and come down to this earth. He was battered and abused on, on Easter and Good Friday, and he was nailed to a tree and his blood was shed. He went into the grave. Scripture says that he in his own self bare our sin, your sin and mine, in his own body on the tree. God punished him with the punishment we deserved because of sin. But on the third day, the Sunday, up from the grave he arose. Why? Because God accepted the sacrifice on your behalf and on my behalf. The blood of Christ cleanses from sin. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. The blood shed at Calvary is sufficient to cleanse every sin. You tonight can pass from death unto life 
from being a child of disobedience, a child of wrath, to being a child of God. But the decision must be yours. Repent ye and be converted. But lastly and quickly, a result to be expected. What's the result? Your sins will be blotted out. The moment I went into that room in Mount Marion Free Presbyterian Church and got down on my knees and asked Christ into my heart, every sin was gone. It's been quoted here, I think, a couple of weeks in a row. Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. The Lord speaking through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 43 says this, I, even I am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. What's the weak chorus say? Gone, 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 gone. Yes, my sins are gone. Now my soul is free and in my heart's a soul. Buried in the deepest sea. Yes, that's good enough for me. I shall live eternally. Praise God. My sins are gone. I can sing that tonight. And if we had played the music earlier, you all would have sang it. But how many of you would have it applied to? I can sing it because my sins are gone. 1958, into that little room, repenting of my sins, I was forgiven. Tonight, it's your decision. You must make the choice. Matthew 26, the Lord is instituting the Lord's Supper and he says this, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Scripture says that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness. In the book of Revelation, John says this. He's bringing a message from Christ. He says, from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, this is it, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins, how? In his own blood. My time's gone. 1829, the year, not the time. George Wilson and James Porter were sentenced to death. At the appointed day, James Porter was taken out and executed. George Wilson wasn't. He had friends in high places. They went to President Andrew Jackson and got a pardon. The pardon was signed by the president, sent by dispatch to the prison. The governor came down with a great smile on his face, his chest sticking out and says, Mr. Wilson, you're a very fortunate man. You have friends in high places. We have for you here a pardon. You're free to go. George Wilson looked and said, yes, my name's on it. Yes, the president has signed it. I don't want it. Consternation broke out. What do you mean you don't want it? I don't want it. Over the next year, it went back up the ladder and it eventually arrived at the Supreme Court. Supreme Court made a decision. One, it was a legal document. It was a valid document. It could only be applied to the person whose name was on it, i.e. George Wilson. But the Supreme Court ruled no one could force anybody to accept it or reject it. It was the person's own decision. They went back to George Wilson nearly a year later and says, it's a valid thing, it's for you, take it. George Wilson says, I don't want it. George Wilson was taken out and executed. As Eric Morgan used to say, the boy's a fool. But tell me, how much more foolish are we when God offers us forgiveness, when God offers us a pardon, and we say, I don't want it? If you bought me a present, went out and spent your time and your money and came to me and says, Ken, happy birthday. And I says, lovely, keep it. Would you be offended? Would you be hurt? Tell you, if I spent my money and my time buying you a present, you said, no, I'd be offended. Can you imagine how God feels? When time after time after time, week after week, he goes to people who are still outside of Christ and says, there's a free pardon. 
forgiveness of sins. My son came down, went to the cross, shed his blood, paid the penalty for your sin. There's the pardon. And you say, I don't want it. How must God feel tonight? George Wilson didn't take the pardon and paid the penalty. 1958, I accepted the pardon. I'm as sure of heaven as if we're already in it. But there's people down through the years who have not accepted the pardon. And tonight they're in a lost eternity. And before them stands the great white throne judgment, which everyone will stand before God. And you'll not stand there to give an account. You'll stand there to receive the sentence, depart from me. I never knew you. A decision that has to be made. Repent ye, therefore. Be converted. And your sins will be blotted out. Word of prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gospel message. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for many down through the years in this place and across our province who, when given the opportunity to repent, accepted the pardon that was on offer. And Heavenly Father, tonight, many of them are in the glory. But Lord, there are many still rejoicing and walking through the scene of time rejoicing in their salvation. Lord, it's the desire of the people in this place, and indeed we know that you're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Lord, we pray that you would give deciding grace tonight. As our meeting draws to a close here and across our province, Port Rush and Limavady, and other places where the meetings draw to a close at this time, we pray that you will give deciding grace, that sinners may find their way to the cross, And simply in the seat where the set said, as the thief we were reminded last week and even this morning, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. We pray that some will accept Christ tonight and will pass from death unto life and no forgiveness of sins. We ask these things in our Saviour's name and for his sake and glory. Amen. Amen. Number 78 in the red book. Please, number 78. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil of victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. Standing to sing, please.
Heavenly Father, again we give you thanks for the blood of the Lamb, the blood which cleanses from all sin. Again, Heavenly Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit will work in hearts and minds of those gathered here tonight, or even those online tonight, or even at a future date, and bring them through to acknowledge their sin and accept the Lord Jesus Christ as Saviour. Accept the pardon, and Heavenly Father, their names will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and one day we'll meet together around the throne up in glory. So Lord, separate us with your blessing tonight. In Saviour's name we ask it. Amen. Amen.